All right, so a few tools you're using. Forgive the sound. Uh, but I'll be using a joiner plane. This is my number seven. Um, lovely plane. I say lovely way too much, I realize these days. But it's true. Uh, so I'll be using that to flatten the surface on here. Uh, and then I'll be using a tool that a lot of people don't know about or see. This is called a kerfing plane. And this is one that I made for myself years ago. It looks like a weird ice skate situation. Um, and then what it actually does is it's a little bit like a plow plane where you can adjust this fence in and out, which creates a gap between the fence and the blade, which is a rip blade, very sharp, aggressive, weird cut rip blade that I made. And what this will do is this adds a groove all the way around the board. So I'll cut a groove all the way around the board so that when I follow that up by hand, I can use a rip saw to go through the board and it has a kerf or a gap, like where the, the leftover spot where the blade was, for this blade to follow. So it'll track all the way through the board. If I just start cutting like this, I run the risk of drifting that blade when it goes across this distance. So I'll be using my planes to smooth out the surfaces. I'll be using my kerfing plane to cut the line or groove around the board. And then I'll be using a rip saw to hand cut the board in half. Uh, rip saws also come in all different sizes. I don't know if you guys can see this. It doesn't take up the whole screen there. This is a massive rip saw that I made years and years ago. I call it the beast. Back out. There you go. So you can see this thing. Uh, it's a good, I don't know, two and a half feet long. I use it for major boards and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but for this task, this would be way too aggressive. Uh, so I'll be using my tiny little guy. Uh, from, uh, where are we? This is a double zero uh, Distant. It's from 1840. So, I'll be using this little guy that I love. It's lovely. Uh, but anyways, I'll be using this one to, uh, to hand cut or to rip this little board. I can also use a Japanese saw. Uh, it's a little finer of a kerf, but I already have a kerfing plane that's going to make the size groove. Um, so that's inconsequential. So, uh, let's get to work. So I'll do this all the way around the board. I'll take a pass just backwards on the ends so that we can see uh, our line when we cut it. 
I have a secondary board here to keep the uh, first board in place. This is how I can get two perfect halves with no drift. Now, let's do the rest. This area gets a lot of attention because of all the cool hand planes and all the fun toys. But a very little talked about area in my shop is this sawtill over here on the wall. So I'm going to take a second and talk through just a few of the things that are held over here. Forgive the noise again, uh, but here in the sawtill I have a whole bunch of saws that I use regularly. Some of them are really interesting and tiny, some of them are huge, uh, some of them I've made, some of them I've collected over the years, uh, and I have some fun little relic kind of things that I keep around. Uh, I thought I'd show a couple of those while I'm here. Uh, so up top I have some smaller tools. So this is a Reagan back saw that I made years ago. I used to sell these. Um, I don't anymore. But it's got this awesome tiger stripe. Uh, it's actually like a fiddleback mahogany. Um, I can show some cool pictures of it, like here. Anyhow, uh, but I also have, oh, this is a fun little guy. Stuck in the back. This is from my neck of the woods. It is a small dovetail saw that is branded, it's a uh, <clears throat> Henry Diston, but it's branded Cincinnati Public Schools. If I can get that on camera or not. Um, but Cincinnati is about an hour from me, uh, and I love that they used to have these tools in their public school system. I got a couple other small back saws and dovetail saws up in here. Um, I have the beast that I just showed earlier. So this was kind of an experiment for a large ripping saw. It has a double handle on it, um, so you can actually hold it vertical like this to cut, um, or horizontal, or hold both, or hold the thumb hole with your fingers on top, which I never do. Um, I'll hold it back here, or cut vertical. So uh, I use that one quite regularly, as well as the saw that I believe you just saw in the video, which is a straight rip saw. It has a thinner curved blade. Uh, it's a little smaller than that other one, but it's a lot less aggressive. Um, so this one I was able to get less than a sixteenth of an inch um, of a curve through the whole blade, or through the whole uh, board you just saw. So that way I'm not using an eighth of an inch on a table saw. Okay, um, other fun ones. I got a set of sisters in here show you. This is a, uh, I can't remember the date, 1883 Diston. See if this will catch it. There you go. Awesome wheat carving on there. Um, but this little panel saw has a sister, which is this one. 
It's the same saw, larger plate, thicker steel. Um, so I use this one for cross cut and this one for uh, smaller cross cut. Yeah. So I'm, I got them filed cross cut, but I'll sharpen these and change the teeth patterns from time to time. Uh, but I love collecting these old saws. Uh, here's a unique one like not a lot of people have seen. This is a D8. This is a Distin 8, right? Uh, it has the thumb hole in it. And so it's nice that I'm wearing a white shirt so you can see all this. Uh, but it has a very aggressive tooth pattern. Let's see if we can get that one on there. Oh, you see that tooth pattern on that. It's pretty intense. Pretty cool shapes. Anyhow, anyhow, uh, this handle uh, is it was highly sought after for a long time. But the main reason is, is people don't know how to use a saw these days. You don't put your first finger in a saw. So if I'm right-handed, I put my hand this way, and my first finger usually sticks out. This is for guidance of the saw. It was never meant to be inside the handle of the saw. We'll do a quick saw history here. I wasn't intending this, but. Uh, this one will hold your fingers and your first finger and your thumb so that when you're cutting aggressively you can actually cut with both hands comfortably and you're actually using your thumb hook to put pressure downward. So I can cut this way and pull back with my trigger finger. It has a slot for your thumb on the side and a slot for the finger right there. So this is a, uh, a distant D8. But I have a whole collection of these things that I use regularly, like I said. Uh, this is a fun little restoration one. It's they, a lot of these were made out of apple wood. So this was an apple wood handle, and a lot of people used to dye them, and I chose to keep it the original color. Um, ooh, it's sharp. Uh, but this is a little rip saw. I got some funky saws that I made years ago. Nobody gets to see these very often. I stole the, uh, the, the screws in here for a different saw. Because uh, I don't use this one. This was kind of a fun back saw experiment, kind of like an octopus looking thing. Um, but I like that the, the back of it goes through the handle. Yeah, so fun little experiments. And also some gems. Uh, so, like I said, let's do a little quick saw handle history. We can show you how the hand tool, the saw as a hand tool, kind of degrades in terms of the quality of the handle. And you can see the history of it um, pretty plainly if I show you just a handful of saws through history. Um, we'll start back, back in time. You used to have saws like these, these little back saws, little cross cut saws. And I'll show this one. You can actually see the wheat carved into there, right? So all the wheat carving that goes around the handle and notice the shape how it's curved and that divot goes in, right? That's gonna be key. The little divot that goes in the shape, right? Also the smoothness of this handle, how it is rounded. I'm gonna show you a couple that you can tell, excuse me, were handmade. Once again, a very old saw, the wheat and the roundness of that handle and look at that shape to leave room for your knuckles, right? Uh, this is all decorative. You can see the shapes up in here, how they have little notches and little rivets. You can see them down here as well. Right. So take a look at that shape and the wheat carving on there. Now, going from this, the saw manufacturers started to adjust some things. So they go from where you hold your finger out, right? to where, I what I've been told sometimes, people complain about not fitting their hand in there. That it's not made for big hands. Well, they weren't designed for all four fingers. Uh, and so you get saws that start getting like this, okay? The shapes start to become more generic. The curve on here is actually just cut by a router. So it's not shaped to the hand, it's just profiled these shapes start to lose their definition, right? And what was in there, because that's difficult to carve. And the wheat starts to become super chunky and kind of weird. But you notice it fits all four fingers. Now it doesn't fit as comfortably this way, right? So it's made for the masses now, not for the craftsmen. So it goes from that 
to stuff like this, even more generic. Okay, no shape here, right? Four fingers, kind of weird angle, right? And all cut with a router or a machine. And then you get down to the bottom, I'll find these saws randomly, and I'll usually cut the blades off and use them for scraper cards. But you can look at this, how ridiculous, right? That shape doesn't even mimic anything. All of this is way generic. The wheat doesn't even make sense. It's just like a sprig of something here, okay? And the shapes, even the routing on this is just really bad, okay? I don't know how that's supposed to fit. So when people say, oh, I can't hand saw very well or it's not comfortable, it's because of these, right? So we drifted from these delicate little beautiful things to that, right? Pretty quickly. Notice the horn shape. See it sticking on the back? Oh, man, makes me sad. But anyhow, I thought I'd take a second to talk through some of those saws just because you see this in the background and what I use regularly uh, for my hand tool practice in woodworking. Now also, let's show you a couple of these little things that float around my office. Students love to look through these things. They always have questions. It always holds memories and stories for me. Uh, so my grandfather was a clock repairman, and so I have a lot of his clocks around my office. You'll hear them ringing in some of these videos when I'm not recording because this weird pipe thing that I'm obsessing over. Um, but I also have some fun ones. This is my buddy Dusty. My wife's grandmother, who was an incredibly special woman, gave this to me, or I got this after she had passed away, um, but she had given it to me before she passed away. It has a little uh, light sensor on the back of it, and so it's motion sensored when you walk in, if it's turned on. It's motion sensored so when it gets light on the back of it, the eyes shine uh, like an animal. It's really cool. But anyways, uh, so Dusty sits up here. I also have some of my finger hammers sitting around. If you haven't seen these, these have been in about a bunch of other videos. Um, but I used to make my fingers into hammers out of cast bronze. So those sit around. I got some fun tools from friends. Um, this little awl that I use all the time is from my, cam my friend Cam Toller who passed away a few years ago. Um, awesome dude, awesome tools. I also have some like surgeon's tools. I said, ooh, I got this one, that's a fun one. Uh, I have some surgeon's tools that I use, like my little tweezers and stuff. Speaking of surgeons, I have this awesome little hammer. And I found this little hammer, I had to do some research on it. Uh, it's a stainless steel hammer, but it's stamped with the United States Navy medical symbol on here. Um, and so this is actually what I'm from researching. This is a Navy surgeon's hammer. No idea what the heck that hook is used for or if that's original. These are really hard to kind of scope and find. So if you have any information on these, uh, let me know, because I don't know too, too much more uh, than what I see here and what I've found just briefly. Also over here, outside of artwork, ooh, my whack -a jig So I got a buddy of mine up in Canada, Jacob. Uh, this is his. It's a piece of lignum vitae, huge handle. He calls it a whack -a jig um, It's what it's used for. It's whacking the crap out of stuff. Anyhow, uh, we could talk through stuff here all day. Uh, but last thing I'll show you real quick is this piece of wood. This is a very special piece of wood to me. Um, this kind of changed my way in thinking of woodworking. I bought this piece with my buddy John Pushkar uh, when we were in Baltimore, Maryland in the early 2000s. Uh, so. I did an apprenticeship in Washington, D.C. Uh, with Dennis Sitka uh, at the Skills Development Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, and John and I were running to this uh, wood place in Baltimore, and this is meant to be a turning block. It is a piece of eucalyptus burl, and it is coated in wax. It was sold by the weight because people thought they would have it waxed and turned green. Um, and I thought it was just absolutely beautiful. I was smitten with it as an object and it has so much beautiful color and pattern and texture in here. And so when I, and I'll get some details maybe up here in a second, but when I saw this, I was like, I have to get that and I don't want to use it for it. And so I put it on my shelf and it was dead square. You can see it's all crooked now. It was square and a little bigger. Um, and so over the years it's dried, right? And shrank 
and uh, inside that wax, right? So it's changed shape. Hasn't checked or cracked or any problems with it. Um, but I was always trying to figure out what to do with it. It has this beautiful line, this black line that goes through it all. And I love that line. And it also has like the traditional kind of burl look that you would get out of a burl. Um, but anyhow, I was, I was looking at this thing thinking, what can I do with it? And I got nervous that line was a bark inclusion and so it would split in half. And, and then I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'll slice it into pieces and make knife handles out of it. Maybe I'll turn like a pepper shaker out of it so I can use it all the time. Maybe I'll make chisel handles out of it. And every year or so, I thought about something to do with it. And about 10 years ago, or eight years ago, I guess, I realized what I'm gonna do with it. And that's that I'm gonna keep it just like this. Because I don't think I could make this any more beautiful. I don't think I could add anything to this by changing it. I think if I make it into something, it might even diminish to me how beautiful this piece of wood is. Um, so I think this is done. I think this is just an object that I keep. Uh, maybe one day I'll change my mind. But I've been so tempted. Every couple of years I'm like, maybe I'll just take a sliver off. Maybe I'll take the wax off. I don't know. It's just so pretty. But anyhow, uh, we'll get back to work. We'll tour around pieces of the shop. If you guys are interested, let me know.